everyone. I'm very glad to be here to kickstart this Amazon conference and I will talk about Erlang. Erlang is a programming language which is dedicated to build robust and scalable systems. It has matured for many years and finally reached a point where it is used as a secret weapon in many prominent companies around the world. It takes root in all programming concepts and to help you understand Erlang, I'm going to walk you through those concepts using a time machine. And thanks to that tool, I will guide you through time and stop at important moments of Erlang past to explain the key principle of the concept. So the goal for you is to learn what makes Erlang so useful to build scalable systems and how does it contribute to today's software architecture design landscape. So let's go. So the first stop is 1973. And 1973 is the year this guy, Carly Witt, wrote a paper defining the basis of what he called the actor model. In the actor model, everything is an actor. Actors are basically acting objects. They are roughly equivalent to programming processes. And the principle is very simple. An actor can send messages to other actors, create other actors, process next message, and do its job and basically repeat. So the model is powerful because it is simple. An actor processes one message at a time, and an actor is sequential. This is really a simple, simple logic, and you can understand it very easily. So if actors are so basic, why are actors so powerful to build scalable systems? Well, it's actually because by design, actors are independent. They share nothing. The share nothing approach is opposed to traditional concurrency, in which threads are used to implement concurrency, and the threads are accessing the same memory spaces and they are sharing Israeli references to pointers. So in that situation, you need locks, you need semaphore to access those memory areas. And this is what makes writing concurrent programs so difficult. In the share nothing approach, the assumption is that actors are independent processes and they share nothing by design. Basically, you can think about that as a mini application doing simple basic stuff uh, on their own. And this simplicity is exactly why the actor model has been described as an, an island of sanity in a sea of uh, concurrency. Actors are composed of uh, code for processing. Uh, they have their own internal memory state, and, and they have a mailbox, as, as shown on, on, on that diagram. So there is only a few parts uh, in, in the process. They read messages from the mailbox, and they process the code and they can update the state. They can send back a reply possibly to another actor or they can send a message to any, any other one. So actors are very simple. They are an island and uh, the concurrency comes from the fact that you have many actors in your system acting uh, together. That's the C of concurrency. So if you have tried to implement concurrency with mutexes, uh, complex use of the reactor pattern, you understand why this could be so relaxing. You have simple code, no lock, no callback L. This is really, really uh, relaxing as, as a developer. And if you share nothing, basically the process naturally encapsulates the data and protects the data. If you are used to go it, uh, summarize uh, that principle with the rule, do not communicate by sharing memory. Instead, share memory by communicating. And this is exactly the same principle that is described by, here by actors, actor model. So this is naturally scalable. Processes are sequential by nature, and this is because you have a lot of them, that you have a concurrent application. But it's naturally scalable, scalable because you can distribute the process on a single machine across all of your cores or on different server in a cluster. And you can do that specifically because actors share nothing. They do not rely on a specific local memory state. So our next stop is 1986. This is the year of birth of Erlang. Erlang is born at Ericsson, a telecom company, because at that time, uh, the only very large scale system were, were large switches for, for, for telecom uh, that were required to handle uh, millions of connections. And that's why Erlang got a head start uh, and addressed a complex issue uh, to design, uh, in the design of a uh, robust and scalable system. Erlang life uh, started with an implementation of the actor model, actually. 
This is a share nothing approach uh, with lightweight process. And what is important here is lightweight process. To design a system with actor model, you need to be able to have millions of process on a single computer. And that's the key point for Erlang. And I wanted to show you uh, a few uh, lines of code in a module uh, in Erlang that show uh, the actor primitives that are uh, available in Erlang to implement an actor, uh, the actor model. So in the start function, you see that uh, we're using the spawn uh, primitive. And the spawn primitive allow to bootstrap a process, start a process uh, by uh, launching, a, 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 by using a new function for that. So this is the first primitive. And that primitive will give you a process ID. That the process ID uh, you can use to send a message to that process, to send a message in the mailbox on that process. So in that example, we're sending only two messages, who is and stop. And this illustrates uh, the primitive to send messages in Erlang. This is called the bang operator. This is the exclamation mark. So you take the PID, uh, exclamation mark, bang operators, message, and you send a message. And further down in the code, you see the loop, which is uh, a process basically is simply a function which is iterating over itself. So you see that there is a rec receive primitive. So you can receive two types of messages with pattern matching in that example. When you receive the who is message, you will simply print something on, on the standard output, the process ID, and you will loop again. And if you, and so the process still alive. And if you receive, uh, if the process receives a stop message, it will, it will not call itself again, and the process will simply terminate. So that's it for the actor primitive uh, in Erlang. I want now to talk to about another principle, uh, important principle in Erlang, which is the let it crash philosophy. You will hear a lot, that a lot if you learn Erlang. And this is one of the most misunderstood principles uh, of Erlang. Uh, the reason, uh, it means that you should not program defensively. When possible, you should fail fast. And there is two reasons for that. The first reason is separation of concern. As process share nothing, you have a need to, uh, to, to have all the process to, that gathers the knowledge about uh, the state of the system and that knows what to do uh, to recover, to handle the failure and to recover from the error. So uh, you delegate uh, that recovery to separate process. And by doing that, you do not cl clutter your code uh, for processing by error-only code. So the, you have a clean separation of content. And the second reason uh, let it crash is important is because of fault tolerance. By definition, you cannot implement fault tolerance uh, on a single computer. You need at least two computers. And uh, if that computer crash, you need another one to recover. And that's why you, you, you need this kind of relation about monitoring, uh, having process to monitor uh, all their process. However, it doesn't mean that your software should crash and that's it. It means that you need to handle failure in some place. And the place to handle the failure are other process. And Erlang is using what is called process links to do that. In the code you see here, you see we have a primitive to a link process or create a new process and linking to the, to the current one, spawn link or link with a PID. And when two processes are linked together, when one process is failing, the other will receive uh, information about that failure, the reason of the failure, and so on. And it can do stuff in the system to recover. So it means that any good system in Erlang is designed with a separation between two types of processes. We have, we have the worker doing the actual processing and the supervisors, whose job is uh, taking care of errors and uh, doing the right things to recover. So, that diagram is showing a typical architecture in Erlang. Uh, Erlang is providing a pattern, the supervisor pattern, to help you build and structure your application into basically subsystem whose errors need to be handled uh, consistently and that need to be restarted as a whole if something in, is failing to be uh, for the reason of com consistency. So this is one of several uh, patterns available in Erlang to help you structure uh, uh, your robust application. Our next stop is 1998. This is the year Erlang was released as open source. And 
What it means at that time, it means that airline could be used outside of the context of Ericsson for other purposes than writing large carrier uh, switches. So it means it could be used for a wide range of applications running, uh, running on large scale, like messaging application, cluster database, web services. And when I discovered Erlang at that time, uh, I realized that the strength of Erlang lies in the primitives that are built into the language for building scalable apps, I mentioned that, but also uh, Erlang is about their excellent implementation, excellent implementation of those primitives in the virtual machine. Erlang provides several tools to, uh, to help with scaling. First, uh, it targets, uh, it addresses the issue of vertical scaling, and it does that with two features. Multicore uh, is the first feature, and Erlang is very good. It offers a very efficient, state-of-the-art multicore support built into the VM. It means that if your system is designed with a lot of process uh, exchanging asynchronous messages, you can use all, all your core efficiently, naturally. Uh, Erlang will, will use all of them, and you will see that if you use Ashtop, it will use all, all your CPU uh, properly. And it, it means that your application can scale with the machine uh, it is deployed upon. The other important feature is the scheduler. Processes are first-class primitive in Erlang thanks to the scheduler. It allows creating millions of processes, uh, can do so very fast, and can ensure that no process can log the VM. So you can create them, and you can, make, you can be sure that uh, your system uh, will run fine and will uh, have uh, no uh, yes, bad behavior thanks to a, a badly implemented process. And then Erlang also implement horizontal scaling, thanks to transparent clustering. So in that example, you see that the spawn uh, function uh, it can take an extra parameter. The first parameter is the node name of the, uh, of the node where you want to start your process. So you can start your process on a remote node, and you can transparently, if you manipulate process ID, you pass them around, you can send messages to remote node uh, without knowing it. This is transparent and Erlang does the routing for you. So once properly designed, your application can run on a single node using all the core and then move to multiple nodes without too much effort. Erlang strengths match uh, several application properties. Uh, and this is because several applications are most of the time IO bound. It means that if you run all, on all your core efficiently, you will have a good throughput. You will have a throughput improvement because you will use properly your CPU, uh, avoiding idle, idle time waiting for network data. And server applications are usually memory bound. Your scalability per server is often limited by uh, the footprint of each user session, of each connection that you're managing. With lightweight thread, Erlang is handling that uh, the proper way. So we'll take a real life example. This is a diagram explaining kind of thread pooling, for example, in a server like Apache. Our thread are AV, you can only have a few thousand of them. So it means that you need a pool of thread and you need to share them between incoming requests. At peak time, if you have a big discrepancy between the number, uh, large number of incoming requests and the number of thread you have in your pool, uh, you will have to put the, those requests for a while in a queue. And if uh, this discrepancy lasts, uh, the, the queue will keep on growing and it will lead to bad response time and finally timeout under heavy load. Here is the typical design of uh, an Erlang application. As the the threads are very lightweight. You can have a, a, a match uh, between connection and thread and you will improve throughput and latency under heavy load. So the bottom line is that favorite design with Erlang principles can generally handle a lot at peak time much better. They can handle more concurrent requests, can sustain high throughput with very good response time, and they can rely on simpler code because you don't have uh, to code a pool management uh, system. So back is uh, 2016. Erlang is still a reference for a scalable system despite the competition. Uh, it's still a match in some areas, error handling, transparent clustering, and it does keep its lead by foc focusing on a niche domain, which is uh, the ability to build uh, 
highly scalable, highly robust uh, services. And it's, it is su successful by doing so, by proposing the right abstraction to make it easy to reason about scalable application. This is really uh, the important point. And as it is easy to reason about concurrency, about the way you will architecture your application, you can think about early in your uh, development process about very advanced pattern for critical and scalable and, uh, application and robust system. And in, in, when you learn a lang, you will see that you can tackle advanced topic in concurrency very uh, soon. You can deal with bounded concurrency, back pressure. In real life application, this is all very uh, important. As Erlang strengths lie in the VM, uh, you see that you're not limited with a single syntax. You see new languages like Elixir or Lisp-like syntax that are uh, being developed, uh, leveraging that Erlang VM. So you can use another syntax to, to write your, your program. As Erlang has been successful, helping you write applications that are scalable, robust, and so on, it has been an inspiration for many new languages or framework. Go Scala uh, has taken uh, inspiration uh, in some part from Erlang. Akka framework is, yes, an implementation of the actor model and got a lot of inspiration from Erlang. So what is the next stop? Well, my time machine, unfortunately, is very limited. I cannot get you into the future. Uh, but already, I can say that Erlang has led to many success stories. A billion dollars company, from Bluetail to WhatsApp to Machine Zone, developer of the game, Game of War, uh, has been using Erlang to, uh, with great success. And what is sure is that Erlang has left a lasting legacy in the way people build scalable systems. I hope you enjoyed the ride. Thank you very much. Thanks.